relationship with God, who we are as the church. As we enter into worship, I invite you to stand and join in our call to worship. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are called to be a generous and forgiving people. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. Praise and thanksgiving be to God. Thanksgiving be to God our Maker, source of all blessing, prodigal creator, baptized and made your own. Now we come before you while we adore. scripture reading comes from the letter to Ephesians, third chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power through the spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that suppresses all knowledge so that you may be filled with the fullness of God.
Our second reading comes from Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowd, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will, be in, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. It is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hot hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to to your Father in heaven. Alleluia. And the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week we talked about the end of Matthew's Gospel, the Great Commission. Jesus sends the disciples forth to teach and baptize to extend the kingdom, to make disciples. And he says to them, that what I have done. This week, Reed read for us, from near the beginning, crowds have formed. He has fed people. And in Matthew 5, he goes further up the mountain and he gathers his disciples to him and he back off enough boxes, but blessed all. The poor in spirit? Those who mourn? Cultures. 
We think of power and pride of place. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful. There's a progression here. The merciful. Because sometimes when we're filled, poor in spirit, those who mourn. We've lost a lot through this pandemic, through cultural change, things we took for granted just in the church. We need to mourn. We need to name losses and recognize that we can't do it ourselves. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness and stay merciful. Recall that Christ's righteousness can become our own. If we live in these ways, if we embrace and name loss, if we mourn, if we are humble, if we seek righteousness, not just for ourselves, but for the world, if we remain merciful to ourselves and to others, if we take on the teaching of Jesus, if we participate in the first three months that I have been blessed to be here in Fort Scott, is spark a desire in you to study the Scriptures, to immerse yourself in these stories, in these words, but to recognize that and that the Bible itself often contains a lot of things that are not very Christ-like. And yet in immersing ourselves in the Bible while not making an idol of it, Christ reveals himself. The fullness of God becomes something we can glimpse and aspire to. My word is a lamp unto my feet. It guides my path. But my path is to follow Christ. The Scriptures point us towards the fullness of God. They contain all things that we need to follow that path. They are sufficient. But they never claim to be complete. They never claim to be inerrant. They are inspired. That we might be inspired. We follow Christ. We recognize that Christ has authority. Therefore, we go. We follow Christ's teaching. Therefore, we mourn. We seek even persecution if that persecution is based on us following Christ. We recognize that merely being contradicted is not persecution. We disagree with ourselves. We disagree within ourselves as a church. That's not persecution. But if we are to be persecuted because we are following Christ successfully, well, Christ himself takes that on and calls us to it. All of these things draw us closer to God. Away from our selfishness, our own need to control. That's what the Beatitudes are really about, is a path that draws us closer to God. Therefore, we go and we share that path with the world that they might draw closer to God, not to our understanding, not to our way, but to Christ. The Sermon on the Mount is about how we live in the kingdom. A kingdom that God has opened to all ages and nations and races Jesus calls fishermen and tax collectors. People within the culture of his time that would have had good reason to despise each other. And he simply says to each of them, follow me. He gives us community, communion, rituals, a baptism. Not dogma, but diversity. 
We've talked about Paul's journey, and we read from his letter to the Ephesians. He talks about the riches of God's glory. But recognizing our dependence on God, on releasing our own ideas of wealth and power, and relying on God's wealth and God's power. And we can do that, not of ourselves, but because we are being rooted and grounded in God's love. This verse from Ephesians has had meaning to me for a long time. It's a, a wonderful image of growth and nature. It also is where the slogan for the preschool that Robin ran for 20-some years comes from, being rooted and grounded in God's love, being raised up, being nourished, being anchored in God's love. All things are possible when we are connected to the source of all life, the ground of all being. I want to illustrate that for a moment. What it is to be nourished, to be grounded and rooted. of seeds, each responding to their own unique situation of air and water, nutrients in the earth. They extend upward and outward and downward, inward. They have to be deeply rooted in order to truly flower and bear fruit. what it is to be rooted and grounded in God's love. If we are rooted, we can bear fruit. And as we begin to grow in God's love, Paul prays that we might understand the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of that love. We talked a few weeks ago about our worldview of what we can measure and what is beyond our comprehension, and yet, Paul says, if we are rooted in God's love, we can begin to comprehend that which transcends us. We can recognize the fullness of God in our midst, even as we hold that fullness loosely, as we don't claim it to ourselves, but see it in others. We can begin to comprehend more than we can know ourselves, more than we can measure or prove, we can experience and share. And when we do that, Paul promises that God's abundant, God can do abundantly far more than we can ask for or even imagine. We tend to get stuck on what we can do, on what our little can do. We don't recognize God's abundance, that God can take our meager efforts, our small offerings, and do abundantly far more with it than we can do ourselves. In Matthew, Jesus asked what's available, and a child has a couple of fish some barley loaves, and suddenly there is enough. 
for everyone there. There are extras. God can do abundantly far more than we can ask for or even imagine. So we are encouraged to dream big. We are encouraged to lean into that abundance. It doesn't mean we stop budgeting or planning. But it does mean that we recognize that if we are truly doing what God is calling us to do, that the limitations we see can be cast aside. That God can make a way when we don't see one. We've talked about Paul's journey. How he was full of himself, full of his understanding of the law as he sought to impose it on others. He has this incredible experience of the risen Christ. A light that blinds him, that changes his path. And we've talked about even in the midst of that experience, he needed the community. That Ananias is called. We know almost nothing about this servant of the Lord, except that he was one that Paul had sought to persecute, and he is called to go to expand the circle, to welcome Paul in, to lay his hands on him, to help him to see and participate in God's healing and God's fullness, to baptize him into the community, to overcome his own fear and caution, to see God even in the one who would persecute him. And Ananias' willingness to do that changes the world. It sets Paul free for mission. Paul spends the rest of his life traveling the known world, starting churches, starting communities, sharing this transformative faith that he has been given. Communities that have no power, no influence, little to any wealth. And yet together the church transforms the world. The church participates in God's abundance by hungering and thirsting for righteousness, by, by exemplifying mercy, by mourning, and lamenting, by seeking ever more purity, by welcoming even persecution when they are confident that they are doing what God would have them do, confident that God can make a way even when they don't see one. It changes the world. So I want to go back to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has given these counterintuitive beatitudes, these ways of being that build upon each other, that guide us ever closer to life in Christ, to understanding the depth of God's love and mercy. And he says to those gathered around him, you are the salt of the world. If salt loses its saltiness, it's not worth anything. It's thrown out. You are the light of the world. You don't light a light and then hide it under a basket. You set it out on the lampstand so that the entire room might be illuminated. Salt is useful. We did a lot of things with salt, especially in the ancient Near East. It would preserve food. It would flavor and enhance food. It would melt. But only if it retains its saltiness. Once it ceases to be useful, it's cast out. Different kinds of salt, different purposes. And yet, it's simple. It's almost unnoticeable. Or light.
God separates the waters and then creates light. On the fourth day, He creates the sun and the moon to mark the seasons. In our experience of natural light, when light hits an object, it casts a shadow. Back in 1670, Isaac Newton defined this as a property of light. We thought of light as particles. It moves in a straight line. If something gets in the way, the light is blocked. There's a shadow. We know this. We can see this. We can prove this. Particles are not waves. Scientifically, we can prove that particles and waves are different properties. And yet light also behaves as a wave. One of the easiest ways to prove and demonstrate that is called refraction. When light hits a surface at an angle and then trans transfers through a different kind of media, things are displaced. The straw appears broken. The image of the Golden Gate Bridge is upside down in the droplets due to refract refraction. That's a property of a wave. My science nerd side can go into all sorts of other proofs and properties of light. But we can definitively prove that particles are not waves, and yet light is a wave. And light is a particle. You are the light of the world, Jesus says. There is more than we can do ourselves that is possible in the church. Our task is to be a lamp for others. To illumine others' paths. If they walk the same way, we are wonderful. If their path is different, that's fine. Our task is to be a lamp. Our task is to be rooted and grounded in God's love. To offer the world the right kind of setting for growth. The chemicals and nutrients. We often think of salt as bad. We're told to limit our our diets, but then there are some people who need to increase their salt intake. Life is not possible without salt, and yet too much overwhelms us. Vision is not possible without light, and yet we know, we can demonstrate that there are bands of light that we can't perceive. God's abundance is more than we can do ourselves, but if we participate in it, we grow. If we participate in it, we help others grow. We find that balance. We find abundance. That God can accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask for or imagine. If we are willing to have our attitudes be those of Christ. If we are willing in all things to follow. To become disciples of Christ, that the world might know God's love and know it abundantly. That's what I believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is God of grace and God of glory. And again, if you're wearing your mask, I invite you to sing along.
See if there are announcements in the basket. Yeah. Reminder that if there is something you'd like announced or a joy and concern you'd like to share, we've got a basket on the altar and you can always drop things in there. You can also uh, email uh, uh, Marla during the week and she will add it to the list. And one thing I want to highlight is uh, we are continuing to see an increase in the number of people we serve on Wednesday nights at Feeding Families in His Name. And uh, so last week we asked for some additional cakes, and uh, that will be a need for the foreseeable future. If you want to bake a very simple sheet cake, it doesn't need to be fancy. We've got volunteers that will cut that up and put it in boxes for us. Uh, but if you could bring those to the church by 1.30 on Wednesday, or if you want to make arrangements with uh, Jean, let her know. We also are in need of bags. We box the meals up and send them out in bags. And so as you are shopping, if you would collect those bags and uh, stuff them all together and bring them by the church whenever you'd like to, that uh, would be very helpful to us. Uh, also wanted to highlight in uh, the bulletin, uh, the Beacon Challenge ends this Friday. Uh, you may have seen, if you're on Facebook, uh, Pastor Bob a few days ago uh, was rallying his Presbyterian side and said uh, that they were going to take the lead today and that, quote, the Methodist won't know what hit them. <laughs> and they were offering to pick up from their homebound members and things like that. And uh, we saw that. Reed called that video to my attention. And so I posted one the next day that said that uh, we know that our Presbyterian brothers and sisters study the Word and that we have studied the Word and that Jesus teaches us that when we are hit, we are to turn the other grocery bag. <laughs> and so we've got a few more days. We've got a nice pile there again today. Uh, it is our intention to keep the coveted can count award. But as Pastor Bob said in his video, what really matters is that the beacon wins when Presbyterians and Methodists gather together. So we've got a few more days for you to uh, go shopping and add to that tally. It cuts off at 9 o'clock on Friday morning. And I want to thank Reed again for doing our counting, and uh, Marla and uh, uh, Cindy over at the Presbyterian Church for communicating and sharing the count. And uh, then also in the announcement on the 24th, after church, we will have a celebration meal together at uh, Buck Run Community Center, where we can spread out uh, and announce the final count and celebrate together. If you are intending to go to that, we need to get a head count, so there's a sign-up sheet by the entrance. If you would mark down that you're planning to attend and how many, uh, we can make sure we've got tables arranged so we can safely gather and uh, celebrate this annual uh, outpouring of generosity for the beacon. Uh, 
uh, Trunk or Treat is coming up. I will have some sign-up lists for that uh, well, but if you would drop uh, Marla a note uh, that you are planning to come, that is a wonderful evening. Uh, when I've done Trunk or Treat everywhere I've been. It's just a ton of fun. Uh, I don't like sitting at home answering the door all the time, but you put me in a parking lot with a bunch of other folks, and Halloween's all of a sudden fun for me. So that's one of my things to organize. We'll be in the uh, bank parking lot behind the church, and uh, simple decoration of the car. Some people go all out. Some people slap up a pumpkin and call it good. Bring uh, a bag of candy, and we will have a great deal of fun that night. And uh, there are also some announcements about uh, Common Ground. Uh, so that is a chance for you or for community members to come by and chat if you'd like to uh, in a different setting than sitting in my office in the church. And so might be a little more accessible for some folks. Uh, if you know somebody who you think would like to chat with me, but they're you know, reluctant to come into the church to do it, let them know those hours. They can just drop by and we can chat about anything. So. With that, let us take all of our joys and sorrows, those things that we mourn, to God in prayer. Holy God, you know us, you know the brokenness of this world, and you love us completely. You mourned your friend Lazarus, even as you knew the fullness of your power and the promise of salvation, you shed tears. You came as flesh, you took on the fullness of the human condition that we might know that you know what it is to be human. You call us to take on the fullness of what we were created to be. To freely choose to follow you. To dwell in your love and your mercy. And so with you to transform the world to renew creation, to overcome evil with good. We ask you this day to strengthen us, to help us remember our saltiness, to remember to cast light, to recognize that no candle is diminished by lighting another. In these and other metaphors, we seek to more fully understand, to draw closer to you, to participate in what you are doing in the world. We pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of the one who walks with us, Jesus the Christ, as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand and join in the glory of our Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. seated. And as Ron announced last week, we are beginning our pledge drive campaign. There is an insert in the bulletin that talks a little bit about why Gala gives to the church, and I encourage you to spend this time to think about why you give to the church and how you might respond best to the grace, love, and gifts that God has given you.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy dedication. Loving God, you fill our lives overflowing like baskets of fruit and grain from the harvest. May the offering we return to you this day show our gratitude for your many blessings, our commitment to love our neighbors as you have loved us. Through your goodness and the sharing of these gifts, may all come to know the richness of your love. Amen. Our closing hymn is What Does the Lord Require? <laughs> share the attitude and mind of Christ in all that we do. I hope that this hour of worship has strengthened us to do just that, and we are now sent forth in service to the world. Go in peace. Amen.